Here we are again. Good evening. It's a beautiful, gorgeous summer night in New York, and here this place is full of people who want to talk about holograms. And <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, World Science Festival is so great. Uh, my name is John Hockenberry. First of all, I'm the college dropout news guy who's going to hang out with Nobel <laughs> physicists tonight. Perfect for this job. Oh, my God. Um, how did I get here? Um, but uh, seriously, you know, we think of, uh, you know, this season is a World Science Festival. It's the beginning of June. The weather starts to get great. You know, tonight at uh, 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 the Brooklyn Bridge Park, it's supposed to be one of the best viewing nights uh, in New York. And there aren't many really fabulous viewing nights in New York, so I urge you to do that. I mean, it's a beautiful, clear night. Everybody's out in their summer. It's, it's kind of like prom season. We think of the World Science Festival as the prom for all the scientists who... Maybe they didn't get any dates, didn't know there was a prom. And uh, I actually pulled our panel tonight. Three clearly did not go to the prom, uh, didn't want to talk about it, and one didn't remember uh, at all. You, you may be able to figure out who, who is who tonight. Um, I'm actually perfect for this uh, uh, gig for another reason, because I actually inadvertently helped to solve one of the most serious problems in physics back in the 1970s. I was on a team. Um, that helped to do that. I was enrolled at the University of Chicago as an undergraduate, and I uh, tested into the top uh, science section, uh, basically junior year of science in, in my freshman year. And it was taught by a, a protege of David Schramm, uh, one of the Nobel laureates at the University of Chicago, the late David Schramm, brilliant physicist, and uh, part of the University of Chicago program, which gave us Enrico Fermi and so many others, and uh, Chandra Shekhar, and, uh, and I was in this program and very excited. I go to the first lecture and uh, it was taught by uh, one of these protégés, a Central European fellow. Uh, I can't remember his name now uh, and it will become clear why. Um, uh, he said, uh, hello everyone, it's great to see all of you here. We have a very serious problem in physics. Uh, the problem is, uh, it's a simple problem, but a serious problem, it is uh, too many physicists. Uh, <laughs> And so in this course, uh, if you're getting B, uh, B minus, you'll get F. Uh, <laughs> if you're doing B plus A, you will get A. Um, I went into the news business and thereby helped to uh, solve <laughs> the very serious problem in physics of uh, too many physicists. So, uh, and, and a lot of the panelists tonight are possibly grateful for that. So uh, you are here to talk about uh, and to listen to one of the most exciting, fascinating, also difficult uh, principles that's uh, uh, now being kicked around in uh, physics and uh, cosmology, uh, the holographic effect. And it involves a couple of uh, concepts that actually we have a lot of uh, intuitive uh, sort of sense of. Uh, and, and I want to present two of those tonight before we introduce the panel and get started here. Um, one is the idea of, of information. Uh, information. We, we, we think we know what information is, right? Information is very, very, like, you know, here you go, information, right? Now, now that isn't the New York subway system, right? But it, it is enough information to specify how to get from point A to point B, and if you understand how to read the subway map, you can get from point A to point B. The information isn't exactly the same as the subway, but if you don't have the information, the subway is useless to you. And, and somehow it, it just, it sort of maps directly, I mean, it is a map, right? It maps directly onto the subway. And of course now, the subway map, nobody has one of these, right? It's all on your like smartphone, which means it's stored on a tiny piece of silicon. Uh, and so therefore, what the, the volume of this can actually be mapped directly to a volume, you know, a, a one millionth the size. Take, for example, this. Anybody got one of these anymore? No. I mean, <laughs> this specifies the number of synonyms. I don't know what the hell it actually is, but uh, it's a thesaurus, and it actually also fits in a tiny piece of code in uh, Microsoft Word. We got here the, uh, just the A to M's, okay? Oxford Shorter uh, English Dictionary. Information. I'm going to set it over here just to remind you of what information is all about. Now, information, the dictionary, isn't the English language, right? The, 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 the space, the universe of the English language is all you people talking. Will you talk now? Just talk. Just turn to your neighbor and say hello. How you doing? 
right there. See, that is the, that is the space called, that is the universe of the English language that you are hearing. It is not, it, it is not the same as this book, but it sort of maps on to this book. And there's enough information in this book to make predictions about what it is that you're saying so that if you actually talk to me, I know what the hell it is that you're saying. Um, unfortunately, I probably won't know what the hell it is most of the panelists are saying tonight, so I may need your help with that. Um, nevertheless, there is information in what they say. The information maps onto a space where we can make predictions. It is information that allows us to be conscious beings. It is information that allows us to be living beings if you think of DNA as information. Now, the information we're going to talk about tonight is much more complicated, but the idea of information as a map, as a specification of a much bigger space, is sort of the beginnings of what we're talking about here. Now, the other thing is holograms. Right. You know, what hol clap if you know what a hologram is. Right. Hologram. All right. All right. I should have said, clap if you think you know what a hologram is. Yeah. Let me introduce our panel, please. Welcome, Rafael Busso. <laughs> Let me tell you a few things about Rafael. Rafael Busso is a theoretical physicist at the University of California, Berkeley. He's recognized for discovering the general relation between curved geometry of space-time and its information content, a key idea of the holographic principle. Please welcome our next panelist, Herman Verlinda. <laughs> Herman Verlinda is a physics professor at Princeton University. In 1988, Verlinda received his PhD under the supervision of Herard Ithuft. Uh, Verlinda is renowned for his contributions to string theory and its application in particle physics, cosmology, and black hole physics. Some of his current work explores gravity in the context of the holographic principle. Our next panel is, is indeed Nobel Prize winner, Herard Ithuft. <laughs> Herard Ithuft received the 1999 Nobel Prize in Physics for his doctorate work in theoretical physics. He's a professor of physics, and of his many achievements, he was the first to propose the idea that would later become known as the holographic principle. And finally, our fourth panelist, Leonard Susskind. <laughs> professor Susskind is professor of theoretical physics at Stanford University and the first to give a more precise interpretation of the holographic principle using string theory. He's well known for his book on the topic of the holographic principle, The Black Hole War, My Battle with Stephen Hawking to Make the World Safer for Quantum Mechanics. It's a, <laughs> it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Please welcome the panel. Back in the early 1970s, Stephen Hawking wrote down an astonishing equation. It would include relativity, it would include quantum mechanics, and it would include information. Hawking's rather simple equation brought us a step closer to understanding the relationship of quantum physics and black holes. When an object crosses over the edge of a black hole, its event horizon, the object enters a realm basically of empty space, of darkness, and it continues to be dragged toward the center of the black hole, toward what we call the singularity, where it gets crushed out of existence. Every object in some sense contains information because it contains a very specific arrangement of particles. So where is the information that describes the arrangement of those particles? Where does it go? Hawking's description of this process was that the energy remains, but the information disappears. For many years, for decades, people wondered, is Hawking right? Is the information obliterated and disappears from the universe, or is it still there and perhaps can be in some way retrieved? The destruction of information was counterintuitive and it didn't match the rest of the things we knew. In all parts of physics, we had a situation where information doesn't get destroyed. So it was a bit puzzling.
This debate furiously went back and forth up through the 80s and into the 90s when people finally began to articulate this new principle, this holographic principle. And what it said is that all the things that were falling inside a black hole were somehow captured in a preserved image at the horizon itself. So if the information is not lost on the surface, the information is not lost inside because they are equivalent. All the information about those objects, what they were like in their three-dimensional existence, was preserved or encoded on the surface of the black hole. And that's a little bit like a hologram. Well, that suggests that maybe that idea may apply more broadly to the universe as a whole. Maybe the three-dimensional objects, us, everything in the world around us, maybe all of the information in these objects is carried, is smeared around a distant two-dimensional surface that surrounds us, and we're just, in some sense, a holographic projection of that distant data. The holographic principle tells us something quite astonishing. It says that our ideas of volume, of the, the, the real world in a sense, might be a kind of illusion. So, are we real or are we just holograms? Let's begin with that. But uh, in fact, uh, let's first of all remind folks that you guys were direct participants in that argument that was described in that film, which I think fairly characterizes the difficulty scientists have not only in, in sort of grasping and fully understanding this holographic effect principle, but also explaining it. Leonard Susskind, uh, what was it like to get into essentially a, a pretty big cosmological argument with Stephen Hawking? And be careful, because Hawking's one of my wheelchair boys. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we're really tight. We're really tight. <laughs> What was it like? It was fun and it was frustrating. It was incredibly frustrating. Um, Stephen had a view which was very, very difficult <coughs> to argue with. His ideas were based on very, very sensible ideas. A black hole is a place where nothing can get out of, but things can fall into it. And if things can fall into it and they can't get out, they're gone. But then the black hole evaporates. Stephen had proven that beyond anybody's uh, doubt. And so things fall into the black hole. They can't get out. The black hole evaporates. Poof, it's gone, just exactly as, uh, as Brian said. Um, it, it was unassailable. There was no way to argue the case. And yet, some of us, particularly Harad and myself, very, very strongly felt that this really undermined everything that we knew about physics. Everything that we know about physics today, and even much earlier, was based on a principle of physics which is so basic that we sometimes forget to mention it to our students. It's the idea that information never disappears. And I'll tell you what that means. Information means distinctions, distinctions between things. Um, a hydrogen atom is not, uh, is not a uh, oxygen atom. An oxygen atom is not a hydrogen atom. There are distinctions between these things. And it was a very, very basic principle of physics that distinctions never disappear, that they may get scrambled, that they may get all mixed up. But if you start with one configuration and you let it go, or you start with a different configuration which has different information and you let it go, they'll stay different. And Stephen was saying exactly the opposite. No matter what you throw into the black hole, in the end you get out exactly the same thing. It was extremely difficult to see what was wrong with what he was saying. It was even harder to make him understand that there had to be something wrong with what he was saying, so it was very, very frustrating. But at the same time, um, it was very exhilarating to, uh, to come up against this basic problem of conflict of principles. And if anything can break the impasses in physics, if there are no experiments available, it's conflicts of principle. When conflicts of principle arise, that's when major new paradigms can shift. And that's the excitement. That's really the excitement. Harold, so, explain to me why um, this problem with Hawking, this, um, uh, you know, the information can't go away as it seems as though Hawking's mathematics suggests it does, is different from something like, say, conservation of mass energy, where matter can neither be created nor destroyed. It's, it's different than that. Right? Yes, <clears throat> it was a very fundamental problem. 
And the way I always saw it is Hawking was using quantum mechanics, in particular quantized fields, to derive his result. So quantum mechanics went in as, as starting point number one, and then general relativity and everything else, and they used all that to derive the black holes, radiate particles. From that, it was derived that there was information, and there was information disappearing. Well, the fact that information disappears is at odds with quantum theory itself. So he uses quantum theory to derive a result which basically was at odds with quantum theory. So there had to be a mistake somewhere. I shouldn't call it a mistake, because what he did was by itself mathematically correct, and nobody doubts that. But the final result had something in it that couldn't be true. And so this is what in physics we call a paradox. And like my friend Lenny has been saying, as soon as you encounter a situation of this sort in the physical world, we are very happy, actually. If there's a paradox, it means there's work for us to do. We have to clear this thing up. And if you look at the past, you know quite well that when people start to clear up paradoxes, new discoveries are being right. made. So you guys are seen friends. several cases, and that's why we're also excited about this thing. There's something wrong. The derivation itself seems to be flawless, but there's something wrong anyhow with the result. You guys are friends, then? Of course we are. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, Herman, let me, let me ask you a question just about this issue um, of information, I and then I want you to go back. I uh, definitely want you to go back. Why, why does the universe <coughs> need information? Why does it need to, to have this information? Why does a rock may, need may some sort of information image? Uh, what you call information we as physicists would just write as terms in equations, right? We think of the physical world as being driven by mathematical formulas. In these formulas, there are what we call degrees of freedom. So things can be this, that, or that. Oxygen or hydrogen, in right. as an example. Uh, all these things which go in the equations. And we are used, in particular in quantum mechanics, to the situation that if two things start up differently, they end up differently. That's a fundamental notion in quantum theory. We can't get around that. You can't have two different states ending up after a while to be the same. That, is, that violates the principles of quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics itself is not such a sacred theory that maybe there are violations of it, but then we want to know about this. We just don't want to say, well, you know, we have to clear that mess up later. No, no, the mess has to be cleared up right now. If there's a flaw of this sort in our result, we want to know about it. So what Hawking was saying, two different black holes start out differently. In one of them, a teapot is falling, in the other, an old shoe. I saw this movie. <laughs> and if the teapot falls into a black hole or an old shoe falls into a black hole, that's different. A teapot's not the same thing as a shoe. And nevertheless, after a while, they look exactly the same, according to I Hawking. I see. So it has to be a different He said that's, that violates our equations. That I cannot be true. There's something wrong. Something went wrong on the way, and we want to know what it is. Thanks for referring to that, because I, I can't tell you how hard it was to get the teapot in the black hole and then to get the shoe. You know, I, I realize that. Sometimes they say, just get, get the teapot. We said, well, you got to get the shoe, too, and that was sort of really hard. Yeah, Herman, please. All right, okay. Let me first follow up on, on sort of the, because you were asking how was it to have this debate with Hawking. That was yeah. kind of your question. Uh, maybe I can tell a an, uh, little anecdote about how it was. In part, it was, of course, all about science, and we're all friends, even if we disagree about the science. But uh, Hawking uh, is a, is a uh, very uh, special person where he, can think very deeply about questions, uh, but he also has a handicap. He cannot speak, uh, so he has to speak with this, uh, by typing words. And then sometimes the debate would go like this, then indeed an argument would be given, and then Hawking's response would be one word, rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> very hard to argue and with. And that's very yeah. hard to argue, argue with. Yeah, and you know, you know and, and, uh, and, when, and I, so when I say rubbish, <coughs> nobody pays any attention, you know? But when Hawking says yeah. rubbish, it's, yeah. it's silent, and you've it's lost capital, the argument at that point. Capital R, <laughs> yeah. It's a big font there, Yeah, right. when Hawking says it. All right, so, so Hawking says rubbish to you. Do, do you, like, go home and tell your wife, Hawking said rubbish to me, what do I do? <laughs> or do you, like, go to the blackboard, or you just sit down at the computer? What happens? You, you go on with, because you believe in your argument. The other question about information, the thing that I like sort of as a way of uh, inf 
explaining what information is. We live right now in the, in the age of information. This is the information age. And, um, but the type of information that we're talking about here, you say, well, it's more complicated. But one way of imagining what kind of information we're talking about is, I like, again, the, the movie The Matrix, uh, where, again, there's this virtual reality uh, where, and actually I had kind of nightmares for myself uh, when I was young. Okay, well, what if the whole world is just an, uh, a thing that's being projected on my brain? Or actually for all of us, if we're sitting here in this room, and who knows, maybe it's just the computer that makes us believe that we're real. Uh, and uh, the kind of information that we're talking about is really sort of what, what is inside of this computer. J imagine you make the, 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 this hall here with all the reality of being able to do experiments. Things fall, uh, you collide things, things happen exactly the way we thought, think about them as happening in physics. Uh, but it's all just zeros and ones in a computer. And in principle, you can quantify how many terabytes, how many gigabytes, how many, I'm not sure if I forgot what comes after, gigabytes. But there are, uh, there's information in that computer, and that's the kind of information that we're talking about. So, so when you say information, you say that physicists believe and cosmologists believe that it is possible to map every aspect of reality that we are experiencing here into some sort of stored code that specifies precisely everything that's happening here, what people smell like, uh, who is mad at who, who, who's wearing like dirty shoes, and, uh, and, and, and what they're even thinking about. Right. Uh, you can imagine that that's the way it goes. Uh, now, just, now, is that something scientists are imagining, or does quantum mechanics insist that that must be so? Raphael? Uh, quantum mechanics, um, in, in a way, is based on information. It's a theory of information. Uh, the way that we would describe the world, you know, the, the room being uh, full of people or not full of people, an electron being in this place or in that place, uh, they, th these are different states, as we call them. And um, it's, it's as if you, know, you put one letter on the page or you put a different letter on the page. It's a diff it's, you know, it conveys information. Um, so where a particle is, is a way of, of, of conveying information. And in fact, quite literally, when we write something on a page, we put particles in particular places, 